Amen, church. You may be seated this morning. Once more, it's always an honor to gather and worship. And as we continue in our worship, I, I want to make sure that you understand our prerogative. In, in a church setting, it has been customary to, well, mainly in a consumer market, it's been customary to go to a certain place for what we can receive, for what can benefit us, for what we want. You know, you, you have a Costco membership and you have a Sam's Club membership, and it's either or. You go to a certain store or you go to another location for what you want, what you need. And church has unfortunately become this consumer market where if the seats are comfortable enough, if the music is to my liking, if the preacher can entertain me for a little bit and keep me awake at least, then I'll, I'll go and I'll be part of that church. But we must not, and I say that with an imperative, we must not forget that primarily we are worshipers. I want you to say that with me, worshipers. I want you to say, I am a worshiper. And it's true of all of us. We worship God or we worship something else. But we all worship. And so what we do here on Sunday morning and what should be the, the, the outline of our daily life is worship. And we'll see that eventually because we either worship ourselves and everything that we want or we give our attention and focus to God and worship Him. So this morning, as should any Sunday be and as any other day of the week should be, our focus and our object of worship is Jesus Christ. We're worshipers. We come here to worship, not to take, not to receive, not to see what can benefit me, but to worship. That's why this is called a worship service. That's why the, the word liturgy means worship. We gather for worship. So I want to make sure that we feel this and know this and understand this so that we don't get confused with why we actually show up. So if you're here, primarily you're here because you are a worshiper. So I'm glad that you've decided to spend Sunday morning in worship of Jesus Christ. Now with that in mind, as we open up our Bible back into the book of John, the Gospel of John, I read the story of this miraculous event that happens in the life and in the ministry of Jesus. Now this can be in a historical Jesus approach, just another fairy tale that we read in the Bible. Oh, wow, yeah, Jesus fed 5,000 people plus, plus children and women. Okay, uh, 10,000 people you're telling me? Yeah, yeah okay, uh, nice try. It's a good story, but it doesn't hold its ground. You can't feed 10,000 people with two fish and, and a couple of bread, bread loaves. Like, it's just, it doesn't, it can't work out. There's no science to back this up. However, as we've been introduced to Jesus, he is the Logos. He is the Son of God. He is the God-man here on earth. And what that means is that because he is the creator of the world, he has the power to do the miraculous. This is Jesus we're talking about. This is Christ this is Emmanuel, God with us. If he can't do it, no one can. But the gospel is clear that because he is God on earth, he can do the impossible. So we don't brush this aside as some fairy tale or some type of uh, innovation within the, the, the first century to kind of get people to love and to follow Jesus. We don't do it and we don't understand it on that basis. We know it to be true because he is God. And so this miracle has taken some kind of interest from even secular scholars and from the secular world. 
But we don't approach it in that way. We understand who Jesus is. We understand what he has done and how he does it. And the feeding of the 5,000 isn't the main issue here. And so as we discuss this chapter, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Gospel of John. It's a relatively long chapter. And this particular section, this, these 15 verses, are serve, serve us more as a setup. This is a setup to what really will lie ahead. What the words of Jesus will mean towards the end of the chapter is what we want to get to. But this introduction and these brief verses set us up to see what humanity's greatest need is and how humanity's need can only be satisfied by God. Therefore, heaven's solution for the weight of humans' uh, necessity, human necessity, is Jesus Christ. Jesus is better than anything else this world can offer to satisfy its need or thinks it can satisfy. Not only because he's a God-man here on earth, rather because he serves humanity as the God-man. So our passage of study today are, is these brief verses between 1 to 15. And this passage starts off with metatauta, which is the Greek phrase that says, after this. If you turn back to verse 1, you'll see this immediately. After this. We don't know the exact time frame or chronological time frame in, in this regard because in chapter 5, Jesus was in Jerusalem. And as we'll read here, Jesus is in Galilee, which is roughly 30 to 35 miles north of Jerusalem. So we don't know exactly how long it took Jesus to get from Jerusalem to this point, but we know now that he is working in his home turf in Galilee. If you read verse 1 with me, you'll see this. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So here we have Jesus beginning to work in, this, in the context of the Sea of Galilee. And we'll describe a little bit and discuss a little bit why that's important. But to help us navigate the, these brief verses, I'm going to make you understand them in, or I'm going to try to help you understand them in four sections. Now, if you guys know me, you know that I won't get past the first section today, but there's four sections with, within these 15 verses. The first section we'll read today between verses 1 through 4, which is the setting of Jesus' miracle. Between verses 5 and 9, we find a human solution to this necessity. Between verses 10 through 13, we're going to read the actual miracle and between verses 14 and 15, we will see the human response to the miracle. So let's jump into the setting. Let's jump into how John, the gospel writer, sets up this miracle and what that means for the rest of the chapter. It serves us well to understand that between these four verses, the geography is very important. When it's mentioned in the text, you should not go past it and, 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 and think of it as nothing. Rather, pay attention. Here we find Jesus, as it was commonly known, in the Sea of Galilee. This is the context of where Jesus is found in this miracle event. Now, as a side note, it is interesting to note that as of recent years, many discoveries have been made at the Sea of Galilee because the Jordan River has, has dangerously lowered and therefore the Sea of Galilee, the water levels have gone to a dangerously low uh, point. And so now all of these ports and harbors around the Sea of Galilee have been discovered. These are ports and harbors where Jesus 
would have left and launched off when he goes to particular places in the sea. What's even more fascinating is that in 1986, in one of the ports, they found a boat, a first century boat that was uh, known as a fisherman boat. So this is actually in the museum, and you can see what a fisherman boat looked like in the first century. It would resemble exactly that that Jesus was in, that Peter was in, that the disciples were in, because they primarily worked as fishermen. So that's important to know, and just kind of interesting to, to know that these uh, ports and, and ancient discoveries trace back to biblical times. Now, John also gives us some background on this. He calls the official name of the Sea of Galilee by its imperial name, which is the Lake of Tiberias. And it was named after the emperor of the day, Emperor Tiberius. Now, the king of the province that the Roman Empire delegated to that province in the first century was Herod Antipas. And he's the one that founded the city of Tiberias along the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. So he made this and designed this city to be the capital city or his capital where he would reign from. And it's hard to understand why this is mentioned. And the reason why I'm spending time on this is because it's in the text. This is not like something that I just wanted to inform you with. We see this in the text in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Why is this mentioned? Though we don't understand completely why it's mentioned or why John decided to give us both names, we see that the, the Sea of Tiberias is mentioned in connection with the final verse of this section. Now read with me verse 15 so you understand what I'm saying. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him what? King, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. It's interesting to note that there is a king already in place, and it's King Herod. He even made his capital city in the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus' ministry primarily took place outside of Jerusalem. So when the people decide to make Jesus king, we see a competition erect. Not that Jesus wanted to compete, but we see what the tension began to be within the first century and King Herod seeking to destroy anyone who would oppose him. So the Sea of Galilee, in a sense, or the Sea of Tiberias, as its imperial name is, is the hub of Jesus' early activity, where he performed many miracles, as he says in Matthew. Capernaum is where Jesus substituted his hometown of Nazareth, and he establishes his his hometown in Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Peter, Andrew, Matthew, and Philip came from around the towns of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus delivers his famous Sermon on the Mount, with, which is in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It is on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus casts out the demons and they go into the swine or the pigs and they drowned in the Sea of Galilee. This is also the site of the Gospel of Mark's account of the feeding of the 4,000. Here is where Jesus walks on water and calms the wind. He also rebukes, rebukes two of its cities, Bethsaida and Chorazin. Perhaps John's official name of Tiberius is mentioned to show the contrast between heaven's kingdom and earthly kingdoms. King Herod built this capital. 
Tiberius upon, he built it upon an ancient cemetery or an ancient burial ground. Now for the Jewish people to build anything on a Jewish or any type of burial ground would mean contamination or defilement. So many of its inhabitants were forced to live there because the king forced them in. So many of these inhabitants were defiled and contaminated by living where they believed was a burial ground. Now it's interesting when we read the rest of the chapter, coincidentally in verse 23, just look there, take a quick glance, John chapter 6 verse 23, other boats from, from where? Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. The people in the king's capital left the capital to seek Jesus. The earthly king could not satisfy, and so they went out looking for someone that could possibly fill their need. Friends, there's only one king that rules the world, and that's King Jesus. And people were beginning to realize that. Now, if we jump over to verse 2 of John chapter 6, we see something very important, and something I want to spend some time on. We got the geographical setting of the Sea of Galilee, but now we get to see the quality and character of those people that follow the ministry of Jesus. Read with me verse 2. And a large crowd was following him. Why did they follow him? Because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Here is the character of the crowd. It is often considered a good sign when one particular figure can attract a huge following. They must be saying or doing something right. You see this guy speak and then a bunch of people follow him? He must be saying something interesting. Quantity, therefore, in our culture is often a good indicator of success. It was a good indicator of success in the first century. Your financial assets are measured in quantity. Your popularity is measured in quantity. In our day, it's measured in the quantity of likes and followers. But what Facebook and Instagram have taught us about friends and followers parallels those that followed Christ in the first century. How so? Well, on your social media accounts, on many of our social media accounts, the numbers may be large, relatively large, 100, 200, 500 friends, 1,000 followers, 2,000 followers. But we've realized that people are often lonely, even though they have many friends and followers. Within the thousands of friends or hundreds of friends that one may have, they find it difficult to identify the real ones. They have 1,000 friends on Facebook, but they can't count five on their hand that can really be counted as friends, other than your mom and your sister and your aunt. More often than none, the thousands turn into 20, sometimes 10, sometimes none. So a quantitative, quantitative approach to success never really depicts quality. So the, the fact that John mentions a large crowd, he doesn't mention it qualitatively, It's a quantitative approach to success, or what people would consider success. The the more money you have in your bank doesn't mean you have a better marriage, or you're a better husband or better wife. It doesn't mean you are a better father or a better mother. It doesn't mean you're a better friend. The more money you have on the bank doesn't mean you're a better person because it doesn't measure the quality of life now it measures the quality of your materialistic life because you may have better quality stuff but it doesn't measure the quality 
And so oftentimes, as was the case in the first century, quality is replaced with pretentiousness and pomposity. It's only a facade of what's inside. Quantity never really moved Jesus, other than making him feel pity for crowds. So often is the case that when Jesus is approached by large crowds, he removes himself from them. He is not fed by the quantity. He doesn't feed himself off the energy of the crowd. He's got to feel the energy of the room to perform these amazing miracles. Jesus doesn't need any of that because Jesus understands quality of followers. The quality found in discipleship. So what we continue to learn from the crowds, and especially that which follows in Jesus' time, is that they are moved by what? Why are they moved, the crowds, by Jesus' ministry? Because they saw the signs. In verse 2 it says, they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. These people were impressed by the miraculous. They were amazed by Jesus' healing power. And John wants us to identify the soteriological aspect in this crowd. For instance, discipleship is not measured in quantity. We will see the crowds towards the end of chapter 6 begin to diminish and diminish. And even some so called disciples will eventually leave Jesus. So it's not the quantity of people who begin to follow Jesus, but those who persevere and who remain disciples demonstrates quality. These people followed in search of a miracle. They followed Jesus because of what he was doing, and some came along for the show. To them, it was entertainment. This guy is healing people, man. We saw this guy heal the guy by the pool. Like, this guy is doing some stuff. Let me see for myself who this Jesus of Nazareth is. Others were probably sick themselves. And they needed to be healed. Others simply just followed the crowd. You can imagine the hyperbole that was going on around the boats. Some could have said, I heard that this guy healed the the guy by the pool. And he even made him look younger. Others could have been saying, man, you know what I heard? I heard this guy could fly. You know what I heard? You know what my friend told me? That he was at a wedding and Jesus simply said, let there be wine. And everyone's cup was full to the brim in an instant. People were, could have been saying all these stories so that they could follow Jesus. But whatever the case may be, they wanted something from Jesus. If it was a moment of entertainment if it was some physical need, if it was something that they can take. They followed because they wanted. Many of you, as well as myself, have encountered friends that are only friends when they need you, when they want something from you, when they want to take. But the true friends are there when they give. You often find your true friends there when you're about to move. Your true friends come to help you move. All the rest of your friends are like, oh, bro, I'm busy that weekend, man. I'm sorry. I I can't help you move that couch. True friends come to give. True followers come to give. True followers of Christ and disciples go not because of what Jesus provides is because they want to worship the Son of God. So, 
in contrast with our times or in connection with our times, there may be different reasons on why you are here this morning. By the end of chapter 6, Jesus provides and he does do a miracle. And people are amazed. And they take what Jesus gives them. But many will reject his true gift. And that's the gift of life. So I don't know why you may be here this morning. You may be here maybe because the religious aspect of your life needs a little bit of an uplift. Maybe you've discovered, man, I am self-centered. I need some Jesus in my life. Let me go to church this morning. Or maybe you're just afraid of what's going on around you. You see the world in chaos and, oh my goodness, we need, we need some God up in this country. We need something to happen in this country. Many of us may be broken, need healing, which is good. And we need to come to Jesus. Some of us are just worried. Some of us want Jesus to fix our marriage. Can you just, can you just fix this woman? Can you just fix this man? Or, or can you just make me fit for a good job so that I could find a good career, so that I can make money for my family? Can, can, Jesus, can you just fix my issues? You just, like, make them better so that I can have a happy life here on earth? Like, I'm tired of crying all the time. I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of, 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 of trying to fill. Like, Jesus, can you just do something to make me better? And, and once that's done, I'll, I'll thank you forever. And we've heard that consistently throughout the years here in church. And often when something does happen in the positive, most people end up leaving and never coming back. Because they only sought Jesus for what he provides, to feel good about themselves. But what if Jesus gives you none of that? What if you're here this morning and Jesus doesn't do anything miraculous in your life? And you're just like, man, that was a waste of an hour. I could have stood in my bed. We could have gone to IHOP to get those unlimited pancakes. I don't know if they still have that, but we could have been somewhere else doing something else, not sitting here listening to this guy. What if Jesus doesn't give you what you want, but gives you what you need? Will you reject it? Or will you seek for something else? Is Jesus sufficient? Is Jesus enough? Or will you always want something more? What Jesus does is give and provide what humanity truly needs. See, Jesus is not our ticket to a successful life. Jesus is not some form of entertainment for us on Sunday morning. He is not our genie. He is the Savior of the world, my friends. And he provides life. Life that cannot be measured in quantity. Life that is measured in quality. And what kind of quality of life does Jesus give? Jesus gives us the type of quality of life that provides one crucial aspect. And that's peace with God. You can't buy that. You can't find that anywhere else. It's peace. You're at peace with your creator. You're at peace with God. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven. Why? Because in the state that you're in, you are a sinner in need of a savior. And sin, my friends, brings enmity and makes you an enemy of God. Makes you an enemy of of Christ. And when you're an enemy, you're always at odds with your creator. So what Jesus does is realize or mainly fulfills the mission in this world to bring salvation and forgiveness in order to make one right with God. To bring peace with God. 
See, no other type of peace in this world will really be peaceful. It, it doesn't even matter if you have economic peace in this day and age. We've all seen how the market can crash in an instant. We've all seen how 401ks disappear like this in a matter of hours, sometimes minutes. There's no stability that will bring you peace in this world. And so why not find peace with God? Though you may not have peace in this world, what if you have peace with God that will project an outlook that will give you peace over this world? So Jesus decides to do that, and he provides this quality of life in order to give you peace with God. So the crowds that followed weren't seeking for that. They only sought after what they wanted. And what's interesting that verse 3, look what happens. Jesus went up to where? Jesus went up on the mountain. And there he sat down with who? With his disciples. The crowd followed. The crowd was accumulating, following this man, and Jesus retreats himself to some form of hill, some form of mountain, away from the crowd. Everyone wanted a piece of Jesus. Everyone wanted to see what Jesus can do, what he can provide. Jesus leaves and goes to spend time with his true disciples. So this language of mountain is important. It's a setup of the context of what the entire chapter is all about. It gives us a parallel with the Old Testament. How does it do it? Because when he mentions mountain and in the verse to follow, he'll mention the Passover, combining this parallel with Moses and the Exodus. In this particular case, and Moses' experience on the mountain with God, Jesus will prove to be the better Moses. Jesus will prove to fulfill what Moses couldn't do on a human level. So this verse is also important because though we may look at sitting, when you read verse 3, Jesus went up to the mountain and there he sat you may think that that's just some irrelevant information, but the language is commonly used to describe the posture of a rabbi teaching his students, in this case, his disciples. So what we see here is the contrast between the crowd who follows Jesus to be entertained and disciples. Disciples who sit at the feet of Jesus to listen and learn from his words. They are not simply captivated by the miraculous, but by the words of life. They come to listen to Jesus. They come to hear Jesus. They've seen what Jesus could do firsthandedly. On the mountain, they come to sit and listen to what their creator has to say. When verse 4 comes into the picture, it gives then a transitional element into the rest of this uh, miracle. Read with me verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So now we get this other piece of information that that really doesn't fit the rest of the passage. I mean, we're talking about, let's get to the miracle, Jonathan. Let's talk about the, this miraculous event. How did Jesus do it? Did he, did he do some kind of like, what did he do? Well, before we get there, we have to see how it's set up. So John decides to give us this tad bit of information that says, now that the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. What does this mean? Why is this mentioned? Well, it serves as a, an important transition to a Christological theme. 
Again, in the context of salvation. The Passover was near. Now, what is the Passover? The Passover was the yearly celebration of the Jews which anticipated their Savior and their Messiah. Where they would eat the Passover or Paschal lamb and bread in commemoration of deliverance from the hand of their enemies. It was a constant reminder of God's provision of manna, from heaven and deliverance during Israel's most difficult time in the wilderness. During this celebration, the Jews are constantly thinking of one thing. Our deliverer is coming. Our Savior is at hand, who will deliver us from the bondage of Rome. And so Jesus' ministry then in chapter 6 is set up in this context. He will not only provide a new and better manna, he will also be a better paschal lamb. As John the Baptist noted, the lamb of God who will serve at this time to deliver the world from its sin. Thus providing peace with God. The other two times the Passover is mentioned in John chapter 2 and 11, they're referencing a chronological marker. And they're telling us where Jesus is in Jerusalem. But here, Jesus is nowhere near Jerusalem. But this celebration anticipates his death. So here, he is not in Jerusalem. And so the reason it is mentioned is to Act in comparison with Moses on that mountain and in Egypt. Along with verse 3, this mountain set up, Jesus will prove to be a better redeemer than Moses, provide his people with better food than Moses, and give people peace with God eternally, not temporarily like Moses did. So human efforts of cleansing and working for salvation to make oneself right with God will have no place in God's kingdom through Jesus Christ. The bread of heaven provides the spiritual carbohydrate for the difficulties encountered in the race of life, but also nourishes the spirit to keep us alive in Christ as sons and daughters, not enemies. Friends, Jesus provides us peace with God, and that is why he is the better food. That is the humanity's greatest need. And this, these brief four verses set this up for the rest of the chapter so that you and I know that we don't need something to just fill our bellies. We don't need external uh, uh, temporary satisfaction. We need eternal satisfaction that can only come from Christ. Stand with me this morning. <laughs>